Hello, everyone. My name is Gabriella, and I spent my summer working under the guidance of Dr. Marta Samoas. And my project involved astromycology, which is the study of fungi in space. And so today I'll be talking to you about the genetic adaptations of fungi and altered gravity. So why fungi? What makes them so special? Well, fungi actually predate us, and they are believed to have originated around 1 billion years ago. And um, I just want to bring your attention to this image on the right, which is an artist's interpretation of what an early species of fungi looked like during the Devonian period. And I just think that's really cool. Um, next, fungi are extremely diverse organisms um, with more than 99,000 um, known species, and they offer many opportunities for applications. Um, they have an extensive taxonomy, and it's still contended over today. And so um, some applications include things like pharmaceuticals, treatments for plant disease, crop enhancement, and food. And then there's also cool things like the um, metabolism of radiation. And that's from like fungi who were discovered in Chernobyl. And then um, under the context of the tree of life, fungi are closely related to humans. So um, some species make some great model organisms. And so right here, I'm just showing you a preview of how my summer looked. So I worked in a team and we performed literature research on all publicly available data pertaining to the genetic mechanisms of fungal adaptations to space conditions. And so for the first task, we did we looked at all of these databases for papers about fungi being exposed to the following environments, hypergravity, microgravity, anoxia, high radiation, hypersaline, low water, high low temperatures, regolith exposure, low pressure, and simulated Mars exposure. And then once we had enough papers, we divided the work and um, we chose specific environments to focus on. So this way we could do a deep dive in what we already found and also work more to find more papers. And so as you can see here, my focus was altered gravity. So I did hypergravity and microgravity. And so what I'm showing here are the types um, and of the models of hyper of the sorry, the models of altered gravity that I found in my research. And the first thing I want to point out is that a majority of my studies dealt with microgravity. In fact, I only found two studies that actually dealt with hypergravity, one from 1996 and the other one from 2004. So I was pretty like a little depressing, but anywho. So the most common way to model hypergravity is by centrifuge. And right here, I just have an image of the large diameter centrifuge. This is from the European Space Research and Technology Center um, in the Netherlands. And the idea here is that the rotor spins at speeds to where the force is higher than 1G or Earth's gravity. Um, NASA aircraft can emulate both hyper and microgravity. And it does so by flying an up and down parabola formations, which exposes a sample to periods of altered gravity. Although these periods are relatively short, so I, I've seen in the study, it only lasted about like 25 seconds. And then for microgravity, of course, you have the space stations that will have uh, microgravity in them. And then for the earthbound models, you have clinostats, rotary cell culture systems, and then um, random positioning machines. And so how those work is that generally they'll just rotate the samples in a manner that cancels out Earth's gravity vector, effectively cre creating like a um, period of microgravity. And so these models are generally successful, but there are some caveats. The main thing is that the gravity can be variable. So for these models right here, the conditions are never really the same. So um, they're never really the same among like different studies or sometimes like separate experiments um, in a part of the study won't be the same. So things like the rotations per minute might be different, the temperature, the inoculation time, um, things like that. And then uh, for the space stations, the measurements for the gravity are not similar. I know for the International Space Station, it is about 0.89. I couldn't find what the Chinese space station was, but my mentor did tell me that the measurements were different. So that can offer some problems there. And then of course the operating costs um, 
sample handling and transport can um, complicate some things. And this figure right here is just to help you visualize the different microgravity models that I mentioned before. And the main thing to notice here um, is that the, uh, the schematic shows like the vector force for Earth's gravity and then the um, axis of rotation. And also you can see how they differ among the different models. And so now I'm going to show you the results that I found for experiments involved with clinostats. And so um, one of the main things is that the changes in metabolic activity may be strain dependent. So Aspergillus niger, when it was exposed to simulated microgravity, it did not have a significantly altered metabolic expression compared to the control. However, the Aspergillus carbonarius did. Um, in addition, Carbonarius um, experienced changes in cell wall composition, and that's just what I showed on the right. So this table here is just showing the types and contents of fatty acid. Then you have the saturated fatty acids and then the unsaturated fatty acids. And um, for the groups treated with microgravity, you see there's an increased expression. And I just went ahead and highlighted the significant values. Next. Um, Pleurotus ostriatus, which is a mushroom and not a filamentous fungi, um, experienced less physical stress on fruiting bodies and a decreased your requirement. And this is evidenced by the downregulation of these genes, DO24, DO37, and DO39. And next, this chart is just showing you what I compiled for the fungi that were exposed to space, either by the ISS or by flight. And so I do want to mention here that there are other outside parameters. So um, a lot of these studies reported that there was exposure to radiation. So I want to keep that in mind. It's not just microgravity. So the reported, the reported genetic changes I found were for the oxidative stress response and then the heat stress response. And again, this is we see some like strain dependency here. So in candida albicans, they had an increased oxidative stress response in those genes. And then we see in Aspergillus fumigatus, it had a down regulation. Um, one thing that is cool though, is how Candida albicans and Aspergillus niduans uh, both had increases in similar heat shock protein genes. So as you can see, there's like heat shock protein 30, 31, 10, 60, 78 for albicans and then HSB20 for Aspergillus niduans. And then some, um, other notable processes I found were for biofilm formation, cell wall metabolism, um, carbohydrate metabolization, me metabolism, starvation, and carbohydrate degradation. And then next. So this is another thing I compiled for the studies that expose fungi to the rotary cell culture system. And so here we see um, genes involved in cell shape, cell wall, budding, biofilm growth, and heat stress. And so some notable similarities are that the, um, the gene DSE1 was downregulated in both Candida albicans and Saccharomyces cerevisiae. And then we see RAX2 in both Candida albicans and the Saccharomyces. However, it's only increased in one and then decreasing the other. But one thing that I find interesting is that um, the heat shock response may be um, associated with microgravity. So if you look at Saccharomyces cerevisiae, there's an increase in HSB30. And as we saw previously, we see similar genes in Candida albicans and Aspergillus niduans. So I think that's pretty cool. So now for conclusions. Um, so, Altered gravity has an array of um, effects in the biological processes of the fungi. However, they're different between strains. And then another thing too, is that a lot of these studies that I've found were not consistent with each other. Um, they could have had the same models, but they were like, there were different presets and conditions as I've stated before. Again, the literature is lacking in regards to hypergravity. Less than one of the 1% of papers I found dealt with microgravity and they didn't report any genetic changes. And so in the future, I think studies should address these drawbacks seen in literature. And again, I would love to see more things with hypergravity. And I wanted to include this slide here just to show the impacts of this 
the impacts of this research at my PI's institution, which is the state key laboratory of lunar and planetary sciences, and then in my um, personal path. So the main thing is that I wish to see my work in the development of studies for future graduate students. So my work could be used in determining species to focus on, maybe as a source of references or to keep track of genetic changes. And then this was my first internship experiments, experience and I sharpened a lot of skills. And I hope to use that now in my current studies and in postgraduate. So that was my presentation. Thank you so much for listening and thank you to the program for allowing this to happen. Do you have any questions? Awesome, great job, Gabriella. Sanjoy has his hand up right away. Gabriella, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. I found thank it very interesting that some fungi are have their metabolic activity affected by microgravity and some don't. So is that because of up and down regulation of genes, do you think? And um, yes. since since uh, fungi are eukarya and so are we, I'm wondering, do astronauts report different in their metabolic activity? Are you hungrier in space? Poor Graham, he can't be an astronaut if that's the case. Now, for the second part of the question, I'm I'm to be honest, I'm not sure how their the astronauts' metabolism is affected. Um, but for the first part, yes, I would say it was due to the like the different regulations of the genes. But also, I do want to point out the studies that I'm comparing might have had like different presets. So it's really hard to say. Mm -hmm.